What is it? I knew it's a good class. I knew it's a good topic, you know? <laughs> Gold cover. This is to control your mind. Okay. Welcome, E123, Lecture 21, Optimal Filter Design. Woo this is really my favorite topic, and John can actually attest to that. I cannot stop about talking about optimal filter design. Like on and on and on and on. And wait till you get to root flipping. You know what root flipping is? When you have roots of a polynomial and you start like flipping the roots of that polynomial. So in Z transform, some you know, some some of the zeros are gonna be in the unit circle, you flip them the other way, you flip them in, you flip them in, you flip them out. It's great. <sighs> Just, I can just look forward to this. Like in a couple of weeks, we're going to do it. It's going to be awesome. Okay. You don't seem as excited, but wait till you flip a root. <laughs> you won't be able to stop. And it's a warning, by the way, because a couple of times in my life, I spend, you know, I, I say, oh, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Okay, I'm just going to just, just flip one. And I was like, oh, my God. And then da -da -da, for like, like a month. Month flipping roots, da, 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 da. and then uh, you know you, you 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 come out of it like your friends help you, and then you know like any addiction you stumble back, you know relapse, all again, and then you know it takes time to come back. And so every time I teach this class, it's it's really a danger there. So I hope, I hope you don't you're going to affect it. Okay. So why is optimal design important and useful? Because you can do things that are much harder to do or somewhat might, might even be unlikely that you can come up with the design that gives you what you want given your parameters unless you do something optimally. Because often resources are scarce. Okay? You, you want minimum delay. So you don't want to use too many taps of filters. But you want to maintain a certain you know, uh, uniformity within a passband. You want to attain you at a particular frequency. You want to do certain things that within your constraints, like you have the small blanket and you have to, you know, you, you have to pull it in different ways. And it's just, there's only really one good way or one best way that you still get warm, you know, still covers you, but you have to kind of like tweak yourself. And it's not trivial of how do you place your, your body at night so that actually you stay warm. Okay? Is that a good analogy? Yeah, it's, it's okay. Okay. So we talked about the window method, and that's great. If you know what the frequency response should look like and you know everywhere what it, it is, then you can approximate, use, uh, you, you could design the DTFT and then... Uh, you know, compute the compute the impulse uh, the, the impulse response with uh, of the system with uh, either approximated by inverse uh, by IFFT or compute the 
the actual inverse Fourier transform and then crop it with a window, that's great. But the thing is, you have to really design the entire frequency response. You have to design it both in magnitude and phase, often. And so that puts explicit constraints on certain power of the spectrum which you may not actually care about. And so maybe there, you could have done something else that would, in the place that you care about, will give you better, uh, better performance. And so in optimal design, you want to design a filter with a particular frequency response that approximates this, but with some optimality criteria okay, that satisfies certain spec, um, you know, specs. And this is where, you know, this is, this is what engineering is all about, right? Like you have some specs that you want to meet, and you want to use the least amount of money or resources in order to, to build this. So here's an example of a certain optimality criteria. And the thing is, your result is going to be whatever, you know, what, what optimality criteria you choose. And sometimes people choose certain optimality criteria because it's easy to solve, but it's not really the one, they're in, you know, the, the one that they really need. Okay, so your result is going to be as good as your optimality criteria, but there might be some other criteria that will give you a better system. Okay, it's all also something to think about. But here's, here's one which is actually a pretty good one. A least squares, basically you want to minimize among the frequency you care, the square difference between your desired frequency response and your um, actual frequency response. Okay? And so if you integrate over the square distance over the frequency you care, so there's some frequencies that you care, you want to, you want to design a low pass, you want to have a really nice you know, uh, straight uh, band pass, and you want to get a really nice uh, stop band, but there's a transition region which you don't care what it is, and so over those frequencies that you care about, you would um, try to optimize or find what is H of n that is finite of length that would give you this optimality criteria. Okay, So this is in the square error. You can also say, well, you know, maybe I am interested in better fit in the pass band and less fit in the stop band, or vice versa. Like, if I really want to attenuate stuff here. This is more important than maintaining uh, a flat pass band. It really depends on the application. What if I really, this is way more important. I don't want to weight them equally in this optimization. So I'm going to weight each frequency or each fit in frequency by a certain value. So I'm going to put a larger weight at the stop band than, a, than, than in, the stop, in the pass band. So the cool thing about this type of filter design is that it gives you more flexibility. How can you even do that with a window? Right? The window doesn't really give you that ability to weight one versus the other, okay? the window method. And so this is where things become more useful. Then you also maybe want to do something else. What if you um, are not interested in the square difference? What if you really, it's like, I cannot deviate by that much from the desired frequency response. I really need to be within a certain delta. Well, a least square is more, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that. It minimizes the kind of the energy of the error between them. But it doesn't guarantee that you might have large deviations. Well, in that case, you might want to optimize something else. So over the frequencies that you care, you want to minimize the maximum deviation. Okay, the maximum deviation between these two the absolute value of that, you want to minimize. Okay, it's called the min-max uh, optimization. And so the result there will be different than the one that you minimize the least square for. And so there's various, various things that you can kind of put in terms of an optimality criteria. Okay. One thing that comes out of this is the parks mcclellan algorithm, which results in an equi-ripple type of a filter means that the ripple in the frequency and the stop at is going to have equal ripple. Because if you think about it, what is min-max? Like I have these, um, 
um, you know, something that, uh, like these big plates that I'm pushing my frequency response to fit within a certain region, I'm push it, I'm push it, and some, something is, you know, is popping out, and it's like, ah, 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 I'm going to push. And so you push here, and then poof, somewhere else pops out. And only when, you know, everything is kind of aligned nicely, then, then, you, then you get the result that you want. And so it actually comes out to be equiripple. It's also called the Remez exchange algorithm. That's a way to find the solution that minimizes this. But you don't have to use these algorithms. You can actually use convex optimization type of techniques, more, more modern, time up, modern type of techniques to solve this. Uh, and this is actually what I'm going to talk to today. If you really want to look at those algorithms, I suggest you go in the book. I just want to give you a slightly different angle of you know, what, what, what a more modern approach would would take you, which is much more flexible in terms of the design. Oh. What? Remez? Oh, come on. Fine. Okay. Richard Lem? Lynn. Richard. I only have Richard. Any other Richard here? Okay. I'll do plus two dollars just to yeah. You're now standing at four, which is pretty good. Okay. So here's an example actually from a paper that we wrote uh, a while back. Um, that design certain RF pulses for MRI, and as it turns out, you can actually pose it as a discrete optimization. I don't want to go too much into the details, but we really had 11 taps to work with. Okay? 11 taps to work with, and we wanted to have, have a frequency response that at some frequencies, it would be, you know, these are passband frequencies that we wanted to pass, with some tolerance, we, there was some frequency that we had to knock down. That was really important that we get rid of. And then one frequency which had to be uh, about 10 or you know, a factor of 10 lower than, than these two. If you're interested in reading about this application, you're more than welcome to read this paper. Um, but it's, it's actually pretty cool. You, you inject a certain metabolite inside the body. This is NMR, NMR. Uh, it's, yeah. So it's 11 Oh, so 11 coefficients. Okay. So the order of the filter is 10. Okay. That's, that's, that's what we had. But the idea there is like you inject pyruvate that's hyperpolarized into a body, goes through metabolism. Convert, uh, converts into lactate and alanine, two other metabolites. You can actually image that with, an M with MR. And they all have different frequencies. There's another pyruvate hydrate, which you don't want. And anyway, it comes down to whatever you inject. You don't want to excite it with like a large energy. You want lower energy because you want to see the product that's converted to. That's kind of the application. But it's, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the timing that we had for then generating this pulse. Whatever the, the, the filter, like it's just there's not there's a trade there's a trade off there. Anybody's want to know this? Welcome to take two twenty five e. Okay, that's the class of MR. But it comes. This is what we had. This basically. Um, and so the thing is that really we don't care what's going on here. We don't care what's going on here. Don't care here. Don't care here. Don't care here. Don't care here. Really care on those frequencies and within a certain bandwidth around them. Okay, a, a narrow, narrow bandwidth. Now. How would you even do this? I mean, like, okay, so think, you, you could design with a window, right? You could, put, you could put a window here, you could put a window. The, oh, the other thing is that we also didn't care about, we didn't care about what the phase of these would be, which is interesting, okay? Normally, you want it to be linear phase, so everything would be real, right? If it's, every, like, in the frequency domain, it would be real if it's, uh, it's non-causal one, right? If it's centered, so linear phase if it's shifted, but we actually didn't care what the phase would be. And that's another constraint, which actually is much harder to do, but you can do that with optimization. And so you could, you could do that with a window design, and 
you'll have to prescribe something here. And whatever you prescribe here is going to affect them how well you can do there too. So they're all dependent. And so that it's just really hard to do. And here's, here's the result after optimization. This is the best filter possible. And like who would ever know that you need to, like in order to really get a nice passband over here, the best thing you should be doing is prescribe something that goes crazy in the don't care region. Like how would you even know this? And that's the magic of optimization, magic. You put constraints. If you can express it as a convex, sometimes even non-convex optimization will give you something pretty cool. But in the convex case, it'll give you the best one. Turns out this is a convex problem. There's really one best solution that fits these criteria. And this is the one. And how do you even know how to prescribe it? This is what's amazing about optimization. You put all these constraints, and then comes with a solution that might surprise you what it's actually doing. But it's, you're guaranteed to do the best thing. That's why you should take 127. If you want to be good engineers, you need to know how to optimize. Take 127. Take 127. Change my life. Not 127, but some other class that's equivalent on a graduate level. But pretty much. And knowing how to use these tools, really, really powerful. Now, just to show you the difference between optimizing for a least square and optimizing for a min-max, here's the two different filters that you get, uh, just for a low-pass filter. Same criteria, okay? Uh, you know, cutoff frequency, care regions, and so on and so forth. One, you minimize the maximum deviation. One, you minimize the square deviation. And here are the differences. First of all, you see that the least square, which is the blue one, it tapers off much quicker. Because the penalty that you do in the square, like the energy, you know, wants it to actually taper it. Like you want more regions that are, you know, small. Um, it actually has though a wider transi transition width, so it's not as sharp as the min-max one. The min-max one says, well, okay, you're willing to, uh, you know, minimize the maximum, so you're willing to have something that doesn't doesn't necessarily go really down. Okay, so if you do that then you can get a slightly, like tw almost twice as sharp of a transition width. So you can use that. But just the different type of prescription of what is optimality will give you a different filter and different performance. Much like the Hanning and Hamming window, remember one of them had you know, equal ripple, one of them didn't, and really it's gonna depend on your application. And that's why we're pr thinking what is a good optimality criteria for your problem Makes, makes sense. Okay, any questions? Now, I assume nobody here took 127 or taking. Is anybody taking? You're taking it right now. How many of you are, familiar, are not familiar with how to solve a overdetermined system of equation? So, AX, you know, AX minus Y, you want to solve that in least squares. Overdetermined. Like you have more measurements than, than you need. Okay, Any, everybody here know what least square is? Least squares? Okay, and knows how to solve it? Okay, that's great. So this is pretty much what we'll, we'll, we'll need in order to go through this. Okay. So the idea that we're going to do now is design filter through optimization. Okay? That's how we were going to design it. So you have a frequency response that you'd like to. And what we're going to do is instead, because we're going to solve this again on a computer, we're not going to use um, analytic representation. It's all by computing stuff. Okay? So we're going to discretize, much like we did when we design a filter using the IFFT, we're going to discretize the frequency response to uh, omega sub k's. And those could be uniform sampled, then they can be expressed by the DFT, but they don't have to be uniform. There are some frequencies maybe that you really want to make sure that you get really close evaluation so things don't go crazy between those frequencies. Some frequencies you don't care about, so you're not even going to evaluate the, the um, 
the um, frequency response on. Okay, so we're going to break it into um, h e to j omega sub k, where omega sub k is somewhere between minus pi and pi. Okay, and you can think of the case where you know this is uniformly spaced. But it doesn't actually have to be uniformly spaced. Now we're going to have a filter, which is uh, actually the order of the filter is m. Let me fix this. m is the order of the. Yeah, m is the order of the filter, and m plus one is the number of taps that we're going to be um, designing. And we're going to evaluate the frequency response at p, which is much, much larger than m, Okay, 15 times larger. It's going to be a trade-off between accuracy and computation, of course, when we're going to solve this problem. But theoretically, we're not limited to how much we can evaluate. Like p could be like 1,000. Okay? It's just computation. It's going to be a cost here. And so really, when you evaluate h e to j omega at, way, at points that are way more than the order of the filter, then you get extremely good approximation of the continuous one. Okay. If you think about it, it's like sampling a signal at orders of magnitude times its Nyquist frequency. You get much better evaluation and discrete and then you, in order to interpolate back to the continuous, you really don't need to use a sync interpolator. Like you can actually do local interpolators and use uh, and do quite well because you're oversampling. Okay. All right. So we're going to discretize. Now, once we discretize, now we can work with vectors. Okay. We're going to work now with vectors, vectors and matrices. When we evaluate now the DTFT at a particular point, this is really a matrix vector multiplication. Okay? This is what it comes down to. So the target is to design an n plus 1 um, uh, filter, which is 2n plus 1. Okay, So an odd-sized, odd-length filter, even order. Okay, Order even, odd-length. OK, so first we want to design the non-causal. Again, the zero phase, the one that has, if, it, if we have a certain symmetry, we want that to be in the middle, happen in the middle of our array, okay, our vector. So the middle of our vector, that, or our, yeah, our vector we're going to do is going to be n equals 0. Okay? That's easy to think of. And again, don't you know? Don't confu uh, Don't don't get in too much. Like, what do you mean by shifting? Shifting is really just where you put n equals zero. When you decide after you design the filter, well, where's n equals zero? Okay, it's it's in the middle here, or it's in the side. Okay, so you just need to come up with a certain convention, and everything works out afterwards. Okay, so we're going to design the non-causal, which I you know I do a tilde, and hence h of it. Then we're going to shift it. So if I have this one is a filter, it's actually a sequence. And if I shift it by m over 2, then I will get my causal filter. Okay, much like we did in the, you know, in the IFFT thing that we designed before. Yeah. Is there a reason why we use an odd filter? Yes. The reason is because uh, an odd phase, uh, an odd length filter, it's will actually have a, a real Fourier transform, whereas an even one, um, there's just the symmetry is going to be between samples. We're going to get there. And so there has to be some phase across the frequency domain, which you can then put, but like you need to know that there's a, you cannot design just a real one. So we're going to talk about it more when we talk about uh, the next, actually our next topic. And type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4, four type linear phase filters. So we're going to talk about them. And depend on the symmetry. But now we're just going to use this simple symmetry. If it's an odd length filter, then everything is, is really nicely symmetric around it. And the symmetry doesn't happen in, you know, between samples. It actually 
is around the middle one. Okay, so that, that's the reason. But that's a great question. Also, if you want to design something that has a real Fourier transform, as it turns out, you don't really need to use complex exponential in order to evaluate the frequency domain because, as it turns out, if it has this particular frequency, you can just use cosines. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, we'll get there. A couple more slides. Okay. So here's a matrix formulation of, of this problem. Okay, pay attention now. H tilde, not H tilde of a, H tilde is a vector now. It's a vector of length m plus 1 that on its values is going to have H tilde from minus n, capital N, all the way to plus capital N in terms of indices. Okay? So the middle of my filter is H tilde of n equals 0, okay, the middle of my vector. Okay, this, I don't know what it is. This is what I want to solve for. Once I solve for it, then I can figure out what h tilde is. I know it's exciting, right? Yeah, I, I can see it in your face. I mean, yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, the other thing that I know, I want my desired one. I have a desired frequency response. And so now I can create a vector, which is p length, length of p, capital P, in which each index or each entry represent what will be the desired Fourier transform at a particular omega. Okay? And those, again, could be uniformly spaced or non-uniformly, maybe just one frequency. Maybe I just care one frequency. I don't care any, anything else. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. But I want to, I care about that one. Like a, a notch filter, for example, that I don't care what happens anywhere else. Okay, so you create the vector B. And now, if I knew what H is, I want to compute the DTFT at the frequencies omega sub 1, omega sub 2, omega sub 3, and so on and so forth. How do you compute them? Well, you just compute the sum, right? Normally, the evaluation, you know, the DTFT will be sum from minus infinity to infinity, but here we have only an m plus 1 long sequence. So now we should have a p by m plus 1 matrix. This m plus 1 vector here Basically, if I take this, multiply by h, will give me the DTFT at omega sub 1. And so here, I just need to put the values of the complex exponentials that would then evaluate this, right? That, that actually write the, the Fourier transform, the discrete time Fourier transform. So it's e minus j, omega 1, minus n, da da da, till plus n. That's pretty much, that's, that's really the sum multiplied by this particular complex exponential. And so each row here, when I multiply this by h of n, I would evaluate the DTFT of h of n at omega sub 1, omega sub 2, omega sub 3, till omega sub n. Now I got myself a linear system. A time h tilde should be close to b with, in the least square sense. Because actually I have way more p's than m's. And so this is a overdetermined system which I don't have a solution for and I'm gonna look for a solution that's closest. It's overdetermined, I don't have a solution. There's no one that, one, you know, there's no vector that satisfy all of these, potentially unless the system is de 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 degenerate, but it shouldn't be. So there's really not, n there's no one that actually satisfies this. So you want to just minimize the square error between these two. Does this make sense? Any questions? It's important, because now we're going to solve it. 
The thing is, we already solve it in the sense that, yeah, you just plug in the equation. Like, you just create A, you create B, and then you just plug it into, you just solve the equation, and then get yourself H. I mean, that's, that's really what it is about. Like, you need to construct A by this, you need to construct B by that, and it's done. You solve it. Cool, right? And the solution is A transpose A, you take minus 1 times A transpose B. That's it. Done. Done. Now, the thing is, the result will actually be generally non-symmetric and actually complex valued. Because there's certain areas that you don't care what they are, and like, why would you necessarily get some real value? Like, you don't necessarily impose symmetry on the don't care regions. So not necessarily should be. But if you knew, actually, that H tilde should be real, then in that case, H tilde of N should have a certain symmetry. So if you want to design something which has a real zero phase, you know, the, a real Fourier transform, when it's non-causal and, and has the symmetry, then we can impose that symmetry on the structure of the problem. And then we're going to guarantee that our solutions are going to be within a structure of symmetry. Here, there isn't one. Yes? How do you impose it? How do you impose symmetry? What does it even mean, symmetry? Symmetry where? If, if this is real, then this needs to be symmetric, pretty much. Right? If this is real, this needs to be symmetric. If this is symmetric, hence, I know that this is exactly the same as this one. I don't really need to solve for this one. I just need to solve for this one. And then once I solve for this one, I can just replicate it, right? So I only need to solve for half of my filter values. And I need then to construct an A that you know, takes that into account. Okay, that's what we're gonna do now. Okay. So suppose that this is real symmetric and M is even, again, so M plus one tabs, then this is real symmetric around the midpoint. Hence, if I write down what is the Fourier transform, the DTFT, it's h of 0 plus h of 1 e minus. So what I did is I, I, did, I, I reorder it so that you've got 0, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, and so on and so forth. Okay? Normally, you would count from minus n to n. I just changed the order so you can actually see what's going on. So h0 plus h1 e minus j omega, h of minus 1 e plus j omega, right? because n is minus 1, and then h2 e minus 2 j omega, and then h of minus 2 e plus j omega, and so on and so forth, till you get to n. OK? But the thing is that I know that this. 1 and minus 1 is the same, right? h of 1 and h of minus 1 are the same. And if you have the same value, and you've got now same value, and e minus j omega plus e plus j omega, that is, that is a cosine. So the fact that you now, now my DTFT changes, it doesn't really, like it's going to be real. So if it's real, it doesn't need complex exponential. It can actually be expressed by real matrices. They don't have to be complex. And what comes out is that you've got h of 0 plus twice cosine omega times h1 plus twice cosine 2 omega times h2. And that will give you the evaluation of the DTFT on the positive side of the um, frequency domain. Okay, for positive omegas. And for negative omegas, you need to just apply a conjugate. 
complex conjugate. Does this make sense? No. So now we're going to change our A to have cosines instead of complex exponentials. But that's going to effectively impose the structure that we're interested. And we're only going to solve for half the filter now. Yes? Well, it's smaller because we, we are solving for less variables. Absolutely, yeah. It's smaller by half. OK. So this is now our matrix. A is composed of these cosines of omega sub k's, or omega sub some something, that are in the passband, you know, that belong to the passband. There also, there's part of A that corresponds to omegas that are in the stop end. And then my B vector, which is my desired Fourier transform, should be ones in the passband, if I want to design a low pass filter, and should be zeros for the parts of this matrix corresponding to the stop end. And this is transpose, so this is actually a row, uh, a column vector. Okay? It just doesn't fit. So the values here, that's the desired Fourier transform here. The values here, the desired Fourier transform here. And then this part of the matrix corresponds to evaluating the Fourier transform of H of n at those frequency, and you want that to be close to 1, and so on and so forth. So given m, which is the order, w sub p, which is the pass band, w sub s, which is the stop band, where the stop band starts, you want to find the best least square filters that satisfy a h minus b in the least square sense. So h tilde plus, that's just half of my filter, okay? just the positive part, plus the one at h equals 0. Okay? That will be then equal to a transpose a minus 1 a transpose b. That will give me half my filter. And now if I want to find the full filter, all I need to do is, yes, for n is greater than 0, I get the positive half. For n equals 0, I just mirror it. And now I got myself a symmetric filter, which is beautiful, which gives me the optimal solution for this problem. Cool, right? Done. Now you know how to design at least square optimal filter. Now if you're not careful, though, though I have to say, that if that don't care region could be anything, then your function could actually explode. Like, can really go to So maybe in the don't care region, you actually do care. Maybe you care that the energy in the don't care region should be small. So you can actually also put a penalty there as well. OK? So again, you've got to watch out there. If actually the distance between WS and WP in the Donkey region is small, then that you know then the function can actually not explode. But if this one is quite large, then the function can go and do whatever it wants there, and that basically means that you're going to have significant gain in those areas, which maybe is something that you don't want. Okay, so this is things that you have to consider as well. So again, optimality criteria. Yeah, I don't care what it is. But I do care if it goes to a million. Okay. So yes, then it's a not necessarily completely don't care region. So something to watch out, the often see with least square filter is that you don't give some penalty in the don't care region in terms of how of energy, then it actually explodes. Okay. So the thing is least square does not have a preference for the pass band or the stop band. Right? We didn't have, like we just had a square error but didn't have any preference over the pass band. And what we could do then is we can put a w or some weighting function saying we want the penalty in the stop band to be twice as large as the penalty in the pass band because we really want the pass band to be closer. 
Okay? That's, um, like, I, I, my feet are cold. You know, I, I really hate when the blanket is not on my feet. So you pull, but, like, your feet kind of lock it because, like, okay, I can pull as much as I can, but, like, the, the feet don't go. Unless I really, really pull, pull hard, right? So it's not uniformly attached, you know, on your body. Like, there's more weight towards the feet. So what you could do is set omega to be, uh, sorry, uh, the weight as a function of omega to be larger in the stop band and smaller in the pass band. So you can put like a weight which is called delta P off and delta S on, over this weight, or you can just do um, one in the pass band and then delta P over delta S in the stop band. Those, those are equivalent in terms of weight, weighting. And the way to construct it is the following way. You want to minimize the positive part of your filter. Just we're inter interested in the positive part. And this is the same equation. Uh, this is A H tilde plus my, uh, minus B. And then this part is conjugate omega uh, W square, which is a diagonal matrix that performs these weights multiply by a h minus b. Okay, this is a weighted least square problem. This is a weighted least square. If, you rem if w was just the identity function, you got yourself back to the least square. The least square. And then the solution is this one. That's all what it takes. And then w is a diagonal matrix with ones at the pass band and then delta p over delta s in the stop band. That's the ratio, yeah. Yes. Nice. I love it. I love it. Incentives. It's all about incentives. That's that's what economy is all about. Eric? Wait, Eric Chen? Yeah. Oh, with a K. No, it's a Oh. So, okay, so I'm going to put like a quote, like a quotes now. <laughs> and you got four bucks now. You're getting close to lunch. Okay. So that's great, right? That's great. Yep. Conjugate. Yeah, transpose conjugate. It's transpose conjugate. And in that case where it's cosine, then it doesn't matter. It's just transpose. But if it was a complex matrix with complex exponential, that actually makes a big difference if you don't do that. By the way, MATLAB had this, has this thing where you do dot, t, t, dot uh, apostrophe or just uh, like the, uh, the prime or apostrophe. Those are different operations. The dot... One is just transposing the matrix. The without the dot, then it actually performs a conjugate. Uh, I'm not sure what Python does. I think it, that's real. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is least squares. Least squares is easy, right? Like you, now you know how to design a least square filter. Let's talk about the min max. Uh, the min max now. And here it's going to go a little bit hairy because I'm going to use notation maybe that you haven't seen before. I don't care. Yeah. I'll, I'll, still, I'll still tell you. this Because I think it's really important and that also gives you incentive to go and uh, study 127. Okay, so you can solve this using parks mccullen algorithm um, and then you can use the function signal remez in order to design those. Okay? That's, that's one way of doing this. But that will give you just equiripple design. And if you want to put more constraints, let's say on the impulse response or on the, on the frequency response that is much more complex than this gives you, then you can't do it. Then you have to use some, something else. And that's what I'm going to teach you, the something else. So the specifications here in the min-max are 
that you are going to have a deviation of delta p in the passband. You don't care a region goes from uh, omega sub p to omega sub s. And then you've got a stop band, which you want to uh, be below some delta s. Okay, that's your specs. Different, different specs. Okay, they're, they're, they're given in terms of boundary. And so really what you want to do is to do this. You want your frequency response to be bounded between 1 plus delta p and 1 minus delta p over the passband. That's what we want. We also want to actually minimize it to be below de uh, delta S in this stop end. Okay? That's great. So if you recall, you know, H tilde is symmetric and real, right? So effectively, um, effectively, you have this type of a pres prescription where the passband it goes from my, uh, 1 plus delta S, 1 minus delta, uh, delta P, and then here is, uh, you go between minus delta S and plus delta S. Okay? And I'm just going to define, let's say I want them to be exactly the same, so delta S and delta P is the same. What really I want to do is I have these constraints. 1 minus delta should be less, you know, of, uh, over omega sub K is corresponding to the passband should be uh, bounded between this, and my h, e, j, omega sub k, and the stop band should be bounded between this. Um, delta should also be greater than zero, right? But that's important, okay? Because otherwise, it could be anything. And I want to find, given omega sub p, omega sub s, m, I want to find the delta and the h plus that would minimize delta. I want to find the smallest delta that satisfies these constraints. Okay? That is a prescription of an optimization problem. You minimize delta subject to linear constraints. So you minimize a linear function subject to linear constraints. As it turns out, if you minimize a linear function, subject to linear constraints. This is called a linear program. And it's a classical, well-studied problem of how to do this, a linear program. Take 127 if you want to know how to solve a linear program, a really important class of problems. Okay? Really well-studied. So well-studied that there are solvers for it. You need to convert your problem to a common form so you take all these constraints and convert it into certain type of matrices, you plug into a solver, and you get a result. That is optimal. Okay. This is how you actually prescribe it. And these squiggly greater than are basically mean that they're vector. So vector inequality, so element-wise. Okay. So I want to minimize delta subject to 1 minus delta. This is a scalar. So for, this is a vector. AP, so the, my DF, DTFT matrix in the passband times H should be less you know, bounded between these two. A sub S times H you know, should be bounded in the stop band. And then delta should be greater than 0. These are vectors. That's why they're squiggly. Okay. AP. Looks like that. AS looks like that. It goes from omega sub 1 to omega sub P. And then omega sub not 1 to omega sub capital P. It should be some, something else. Yeah. Omega sub S. Yeah. I found it. I found it. Okay. Dollars. I got dollars. <laughs> okay. So how do you solve this? Yeah. Um, so when we the of H, they can be arbitrary real values, right? Yeah. They can be arbitrary real values. I mean, you can't 
Well, I mean, up to the accuracy. So, like, floating point accuracy. Oh, but I assume that this is more an integer. Than no, it's not an integer at all. No, no, no. It's not an integer. A H can be anything. Floating point, whatever. So the, your accuracy is going to depend, like the, the machine accuracy is just going to give you some deviations from the real solution, but it's going to be up to machine precision. So 10 to the minus, I don't know, uh, if double precision, I don't know, single precision 10 to the minus 14, something like this. Double precision is like what? Yeah, but this is not nearest integer, right? We're using floating points. You, well, you're getting you, you're solving your optimization up to a certain accuracy. Actually, all of these are even iterative algorithms. You can actually bound how far you are from the optimal solution. You can actually find that bound. bound. But you know, with with machine pre precisions, you can get, I mean, almost as good as you like with this thing. Whatever your computer can actually compute. So the truth is that your computer, like even if you do filter design, it's still has fixed point, right? Like at the end, at the end, it still has limited by the machine precision. It's usually not a, I mean, not even close to dominated by noise and by the system stability. That is not an issue at all, and it's not an integer programming, absolutely not. Okay, so how do you solve this? There's tools. If you want to learn how to pose these problems and solve them, there are many tools. One of them in Malab is called CVX which is just a way to prescribe a problem exactly like this in MATLAB, and it will translate, you know, put the, construct the matrices for you. There's CVX op, CVX mod, and Python to do this, and they all use engines like Sudumi to solve the optimization, or MOSEC, which is commercial. Here's an example of this min-max optimal design. This is using CVX in MATLAB. But basically what I do here, I set what M is, P is, I call it MM, is 15 times M. I construct the vectors of the uh, omegas, I make the matrices of AP and AS, and then I just prescribe these constraints. And then I run it. And I solve it, and I get this filter, which was equiripple design. Sweet. One thing that you need to know is you need to know what omega sub p and omega sub n is. So it only minimizes the, the, the ripple, right? So depending on what you pick, you're going to get different ripple. What if you are actually interested into having a specific ripple, but then minimize the transition? As it turns out, that's a little bit harder in the sense that it's not convex. But what you could do then is you could solve a problem for some omega sub s, and some omega sub p with a certain distance. And if you get a delta that is less than the value that you want, you can squeeze in the distance. Now, if delta is bigger, then you can relax it. And you do basically what's called a bisection. So you solve the problem many, many times, do bisection. What if you minimize the, want to minimize the order of your filter? You can also run it through a bisection, too. If you can't meet the specs with a small m, you have to increase m. If you overmeet your specs with a larger M, you can decrease it till you get the optimal one. Okay? And that's through bisection. And that's what these are kind of the variations that you can actually you can do. Okay? Till till you get the most tightest M. And so if you want to learn about this more, take 127. Have I said that enough? I'll say it one more time. Take 127. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>